how do we know that any of this happened? I mean, I addressed historical questions to some extent and archaeological questions to some extent all along. And now we, uh, in looking into who wrote the Bible, we were looking at the merger of literary and historical questions. But uh, in the bigger, larger picture, how do we know that ancient Israel was there? Uh, or that so much of what we've read fits into any kind of real existence of a real nation sometime. For some people, that's just a ridiculous question. Well, of course it was there. I mean, when you don't write off a millennium and a half or so of a country's existence and say, you know, you, you need to prove it was there, I mean, you know. When, but uh, sadly, I guess, uh, we do. Uh, and I'll talk about the reasons why it's necessary to do this at the end, but understand I wouldn't be bringing this up if they weren't, in fact, uh, people out there who, for all kinds of re reasons, whether they're religious or political or social or stupid, uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, there are people, even some of them very you know, respectable people with, with chaired professorships in, in, in my field, uh, saying it's all made up, and there are you know, politicians saying it all made up. I uh, gave you for your assigned reading an article titled, Does Israel Have No Roots There in History? Uh, the article, I gave you an article titled, Does Israel Have No Roots There in History? that I read for Huffington Post. And. Uh, if someone came to you and said, okay, you're taking this course in the Bible, and uh, yeah, but none of that ever happened. And you go, okay, well, starting with two naked people, two magic trees, and a talking snake, a re reasonable people can disagree, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, you go, well, okay, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, uh, all of them, Joseph, right, we don't have physical evidence uh, of that. Uh, the exodus we will deal with next time as to uh, actual evidence. The conquest described in the book of Joshua, the physical evidence is that it did not happen. On the other hand, the farther down we go in history and the more it's Israel living in its land and not being out in a wilderness in Sinai somewhere, the uh, evidence becomes more capable of being found and evaluated. So uh, when people even question all of that, uh, when people question that there are any of those kings of Israel. Uh, when people challenge the New Testament and say there's no such person as Jesus, which I consider to be a truly stupid position, just so you know, and I, I've told you I don't do AD, I, but it just strikes me that that, that one's a stretch. <laughs> um, I think when people do that sort of thing, one thing you could do if you want to be nasty is, is try to prove to them that they don't exist. Uh, the people <laughs> making the argument. This, this was actually done. Uh, some of you know, in, in, uh, math majors know about, you know, uh, Nicholas Bourbaki, uh, the greatest mathematician of all time, apparently. Uh, it was a group of French mathematicians, like four brilliant guys, <coughs> decided each to publish a paper in the mathematical journals, not in their own name, but in the name of a guy, Nicolas Bourbaki, who they made up. And so suddenly, there were like four brilliant papers published by this guy, Bourbaki. And uh, they each continued to do this. Now, that's a kind of humility that you would never find in Bible scholars, that we would ever be willing to do something good that we thought of and publish it in another person's name, let alone a fictitious person's name. 
So um, they formed this continuous society that if any of them died, someone would replace them. <laughs> and there would always be articles coming out in, <laughs> by Bourbaki. And after a while, they would do a fish shrift, you know, like, like that's where other people write articles in your honor and they do a whole book of articles in your honor. They would do a Bourbaki fish shrift where people would, would, would publish. And this went on and on until finally some young scholar said he was going to expose this whole thing. And he was going to prove that, he said, in fact, this whole thing is made up. And he showed it was in the, probably like in Who Wrote the Bible. He showed the, 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 the writing, <laughs> the, the language, whatever. Maybe he went into style. I don't know. You know, I don't approve of style as evidence. And, uh, and he established you know, who they were and that, the, 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 that there was no Bourbaki. And he published this article. And uh, all the others came down on him and they published articles saying that's ridiculous. I just had drinks with Bourbaki last week. I introduced <laughs> Bourbaki to his wife. I, you know, and they did all this stuff. They said, and in fact, they all brought evidence that the guy who wrote that article does not exist. So, and I always think that we're more fun than math, than my math colleagues, but I got to admit, they beat us uh, on that one. So, uh, how do you prove, you know, something so long ago uh, that it happened? Or how do you claim that something so long ago, but is an entire country producing buildings and literature and so on, uh, that it didn't happen? So what I mean to defend is essentially for the biblical period, which is where I really know my field, uh, but beyond it, too, that, that for 1,500 years, uh, Israel slash Judah was the majority population of the land and were its government. And sometimes that means an independent government. Sometimes it does not. It means a government under you know, the, 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 the authority of the Persians or the, the Greeks, uh, a puppet government, but uh, nonetheless a, a, a government. How do we know this? How can I claim that? So how do you know that they were there? First of all, the first body of evidence is inscriptions. Inscriptions are the really good stuff. Now we had uh, Professor Tom Levy lecture here. Uh, I hope some of you were, were at that lecture and where he showed the extraordinary new level to which archaeology has arrived that uh, where they're, they're using drones and balloons and helicopters to get these extraordinary angles on sites and, and examine sites with MRIs and, and then take you with re remarkable 3D imagery into reconstructions of, of the whole thing. It's, it, it's quite extraordinary. And uh, even though at the most basic level of archaeology, uh, just, you know, a shovel and a, and, and a broom and, and washing pottery and so on. Um, you have inscriptions are the great interest. And my colleague Levy, it took, took us forever to get him interested in inscriptions because he likes Calcolithic period and Neolithic. And it, if people can write, the world is already starting to get boring to him, you know? <laughs> And uh, so we, we finally, I mean, he could find an inscription, you know, from Aaron, Moses, mom always liked you better, and, and it would not impress him. He, in pure, in beautiful King James English, so you know it's authentic, you know. And, and uh, but for people like me, you know, inscriptions are, 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 are exciting. And uh, the first time I visited the site of Lachish, which was, you know, where Sennacherib <coughs> wiped out everybody before he went on and captured, tried to capture, you know, it surrounded uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Lachish was the second biggest city in Judah, and it was a, a tremendous uh, event. And uh, when I went up there, the day I pulled up and I was going to meet uh, uh, Professor Sishkin, the, the uh, archaeologist who was directing those excavations, um, they just found an inscription. And everything else stopped. Everybody got excited. And uh, yeah, when you get something with actual writing, you know, you have hope of something so much more specific. 
Uh, if you get uh, an inscription with somebody's name on it, you're looking at the name of somebody out of that world. If you look at uh, what's called a bulla, a, a stamp, which is usually in clay and either with a, a ring or a cylinder seal, you put your seal into the clay. When you, when you find either the seal, which we find sometimes, that's like the really best, or you find the stamp that was made from it, you're looking at you know, the signature of somebody from biblical times. So uh, inscriptions are cool. And uh, the inscriptions now from all over Israel are, are in the, the many thousands. And uh, they're vastly in Hebrew. You, there's, I'll mention some. I mean, you, you can get something in Aramaic or you know, in, in a, another language occasionally. But they're, they're, it's Hebrew. And a lot of them have names on them. And the names, uh, if you look in, in, in that article that you were assigned to read, I gave just three examples. I gave uh, Hoshaya uh, in English, Hoshiahu in Hebrew, um, Ahijah in English, Ahiyahu in Hebrew, uh, Shemariah, Shemariahu in Hebrew. Um, anything that ends in that Yahu or Yah, that's the name Yahweh. That's how it would be spelled on, a, uh, on an inscription. Uh, and so names, you know, like uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah uh, in, in English, that Isaiah is Yishayahu, uh, Jeremiah is Yirmiyahu, uh, it means like, Yahweh lifts me up, Yishayahu, uh, Yahweh saves me, Shemayahu, Yahweh protects me. Uh, that, uh, you've seen this uh, in other things too, with the, with the Pharaoh names also like Ramses, that uh, it's the name of a god and, and then a verb. God loves me, God, this is, sometimes it's a noun, uh, aviyahu, God, God is my father, uh, stuff like that. So what you have then is a lot of inscriptions with people who are obviously worshipers of a God named Yahweh. These things, the, the, the uh, thing you use to make the, uh, the uh, signed uh, seals uh, are called signets and they're either a cylinder one or a, uh, a ring. And the stamps are called bullae, one bulla, two bullae, uh, from the Latin uh, for that. We have these and we have burial inscriptions from the eighth, seventh, and sixth centuries BCE. They've been found in Jerusalem, in Lachish, in Megiddo, in Ramat Rachel. I mean, you don't have to memorize every place where we found them, but be aware that we found them in a lot of places. Uh, altogether, these bulli that we have found, there are about a thousand that have been found so far. It's names of people that uh, way disproportionately have the God element, the theophoric element, uh, Yahweh, and then uh, another bunch with the theophoric element, uh, El, of the, what is it? It's now, it's like 1,200 something of them we found, and I think, what was it, like 800 something of the 1,200 something have the name Yahweh in them. At uh, Samaria, the Samaria, where the good Samaritans came from, and even the bad Samaritans uh, came from Samaria. Uh, so that was, yeah, you know, from the time of Omri and Ahab, it was the capital of uh, Israel in the northern kingdom there. And it was a Harvard expedition, and uh, they found over 60 Ostraca, there, you know, an ostracon means a broken <coughs> piece of pottery. We talked about where the term ostracism comes from, didn't I? No. You're not looking at me like you know that. Yes. Like, I, I didn't, see, I don't know what I've said to whom. An ostracon, no pen. Pen, oh, purple, cool. It's from the, the, uh, the Greek word, it means a shard, a broken piece of pottery. And uh, the Greeks were very brilliant, extraordinary, psychologically inf uh, inf inf insightful, nutty, crazy, sick people. And they, uh, they had this cool custom in Athens, not this Athens. And um, uh, they would, uh, 
in the, what they, they called it perfect democracy. I meant slaves didn't participate and foreigners didn't participate and women didn't participate. But it, it takes a while to get this democracy thing down, you know. But they, they, they were, all the citizen male guys participated. And they got to do this custom where you, everybody would, would, would be handed uh, a broken piece of pottery because it's a very useful thing for voting and all. You, it's nothing to do with them. They were broken, so, you know. And you'd, you'd write the name of the person you'd most like to see thrown out of town forever. <laughs> and the person who got the most votes was exiled. And that is where we get the term in English to ostracize somebody. Comes from that because it, it exile, and sometimes it was like the tyrant of the city, the, which just meant the king, you know, of, of the city would be you'd get the votes, and and uh, and you were sent away never to come back. So uh, an ostracon is a a very cool word. I mean, language is wonderful. You know. Greek history is wonderful also, but uh, you know, and it's B.C. So I know a little uh, about, it, and I do Greek. Mm -hmm. Rome, Latin, as, as, as Garrett Morris used to say on Saturday Night Live, I don't know, you know. So, <laughs> Chico Escuela. Um, at, this, at Samaria, you remember Samaria? We were on Samaria about 10 minutes back. Uh, they found over 60 ostraca there letters written in, in uh, Hebrew. And they were from the 8th century. So that was very good. And since then they've been back, and I think the number of the Samaria Ostrich is over 100 now. Um, they found various other letters on Ostrich and Papyrus, it states from the 7th century. Lachish, where I mentioned, they, they found one as I happened to pull up. There's the Lachish letters, they're from the 6th century, and uh, at Lachish, or Lachish, some people pronounce it in English. They shouldn't, but they do. Uh, the Lachish letters, there's 22 of them, and it's written by an officer at Lachish um, in uh, the days of, of, of war and confrontation there. At uh, Arad, uh, that's uh, down in the south. Let me give you a, a bit of a picture of this. Okay, the uh, do you now by now we all know this, what that means well. Um, so uh, Samaria is up here in the, the middle of the the northern uh, part of Israel. Lachish is in Judah, and it's it's farther west than. Then Jerusalem and Arad is, is uh, down here in the southern part that's called the Negev, the, the, the uh, southern part uh, of the country. So that is to say from various sites from all around the country. At Arad, uh, that's where there, there was a temple that was found. Uh, one of the inscriptions we found there referred to the sons of Korach as being the priests there. Um, and at Arad, there were all, altogether over 100 uh, Hebrew ostraca, and they're from the 9th through the 6th centuries BCE. At Beersheba, which is also a uh, town in the southern uh, part of uh, Israel, right in the middle, that's Beersheba, Beersheba. Um, not to be confused with Bathsheba, that was David's wife, Susan Hayward. And uh, there we have Ostraca from the 8th century. Interestingly, we have uh, alphabetic texts. Uh, the official title, they're called abecedaries. And an, and an abecedary is a, it's just a practice text where it goes, uh, the Hebrew alphabet, somebody's writing out Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, and the, you write out all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And we have those from the 10th through the 1st century BCE. That is, in every generation, people are learning the alphabet. So when people tell you that everybody was illiterate back in those days, they don't know what they're talking about. If you have ABC degrees, that means people are practicing writing the alphabet. And if you have these hundreds of letters that various people are writing, and they're not all scribes, they're, they're various kinds of pe people, uh, it means uh, 
some fair number of people knew how to write. If it was only the upper class, if it was only the, the, the priestly class, the royal, uh, but it may have been even poorer people. I mean, if you want to learn to write, to read and write, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard, is it? I mean, th there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so at least a, a rudimentary kind of reading and writing, even an idiot could learn to do. It's not, I, I mean, you all learn to do it you know, I don't know when you all learned the alphabet, but it was pretty early in life. And it may have taken you a little longer to be able to write the Brothers Karamazov, but, but, but you know, at least, you know, the basics. So the alphabetic texts are, are, are uh, important, and they also then show how the letters were formed in different periods. We will return to that point, that an Aleph looks this way in the ninth century and looks this way in the fifth century, and letters changed in less than a century. They would change much faster in, in the way that most people were writing them than they changed it faster than they do now because we have electronic means of writing. Even the printing press changed everything, let alone now with uh, electronic tools to write, uh, word processors, because uh, if I pick the, the, the Times font to use, everybody else can pick the Times font and, and all our letter, we'll form our letters exactly the same. Uh, whereas if people are writing letters only and it's not as common to write, uh, then, then over a generation, a new twist that I use when I form my bait, a guy who gets a note of mine, it'll influence how he makes his bait and, th and that'll spread. And then by the next generation, people aren't making it the way they originally looked. So we'll return to the development of the scripts. So uh, I was even there uh, for uh, a discovery of, uh, of one uh, that uh, this came up earlier in the course, the, the, uh, the priestly blessing in the book of Numbers, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine and be gracious to you, may the Lord uh, give you peace. Um, there's a place uh, in front of uh, St. Andrew's Hospice in Jerusalem, the, the Church of Scotland, uh, just down the street from the King David Hotel near the railroad station in Jerusalem. And um, I, I was staying there and I look out my window, I see these people excavating. So I go out and they're, they're a team from the University of Tel Aviv. What, what the heck were they doing in Jerusalem? We should have thrown them out anyway. And uh, I'll give it to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem team, but it was a Tel Aviv team. And uh, the, this uh, archaeologist, Gabi Barkai, leading them, and I, I introduced myself as, this, at that time, a young scholar in the field, you know. And uh, they had uh, discovered some uh, tombs from the Iron Age, from the, the period of the kings, uh, right there uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, in one was this silver piece where uh, they, they'd hammered the silver as flat as like aluminum foil, and then with the stylus you write letters in it, and then you roll it up, you put a string through it, you wear it around your neck as an amulet. And they found one of these in one of the tombs, and they couldn't open it because every time you tried to open it, you know, it was silver that was two and a half thousand years old, so it, it, would, it would crack. And uh, one curator at the Israel Museum, Adi Ardaini, said she was not going to give up, she was going to get it, and she invented this muck this stuff of, of uh, acrylic and glue and clay and I don't know what. And, uh, and spread it all around the outside and then opened it, you know, like a gazillionth of an inch and then you, you put more stuff on you, another two gazillionths, three gazillionths, until she finally could open up the whole thing and, and it said, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine on you. So it's the oldest piece of Bible ever found. It's the priestly blessing from the book of uh, Numbers. And there are actually two of them. One is a little more complete than the other. And neither is exactly word for word the same as in Numbers, but it's almost, you know, within a word or two of what it says in Numbers. And you can go see those now. They're, they're uh, in the Israel Museum, or there's copies of them in absolutely every tourist shop in Jerusalem. You can buy one and wear it around your neck uh, yourself, the priestly blessing. Um, in the city of David, where my, my students and I were there for four of the eight uh, seasons, one summer they found um, uh, over 40 bullae, these stamps in clay, 
and they were fired. They were apparently uh, in a building that was uh, burned in the Babylonian destruction in 587, so you can, you can really date them. And uh, further evidence of that is the names in them. Uh, not all of them are readable, but most of them are readable. You can, so you're getting the names of actual people living in Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah, you know, at the time of the destruction of the temple and all. And uh, one of them is Gamariah ben Shaphan. Gamariah, or Hebrew would be Gamariahu or Gamariah, Gamariah ben Shaphan. Well, you remember, you know Shaphan, he's, he's the guy, he went to Hilkiah the priest, and Hilkiah the priest says to Shaphan, I have found a book of the Torah in the house of the Lord. Well, there he is. And his son Gamariah is also actually mentioned, but not in the texts we read in Kings. He's, he's in the book of Jeremiah. It's, uh, he, ooh, sorry. He's uh, alive and well, uh, a biblical person. And, and we've got his autograph. And that's just one of many. Now, we can go on and on with those, but I, it's, there's a, a terribly dirty joke where the punchline is, no, just enough to win. But I won't, I won't tell you the joke. But uh, my, my point was, uh, just, just enough to win, to, to establish that, that we're talking about thousands and thousands of inscriptions in Hebrew, uh, about 1,200 just of these seals alone, plus all these others that are whole letters and things written in Hebrew. And uh, we know, so what we can say about them is they're in the Hebrew language, and they are written by some people who worship some god named Yahweh. Then there's uh, explicit references to uh, uh, kings and people in, in uh, Israel, not only in the Hebrew texts, but we have them from the, the countries all around. The basic message is everybody knew that Israel was there because we have inscriptions referring to Israel or, or Judah and its kings in Egyptian and Akkadian and Moabite and Aramaic and then in Hebrew. So the most famous uh, first one is this uh, Pharaoh Merneptah. Some people pick him as the one they think is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Some think he's before, he's after. I'm not fighting for the Exodus at the moment, but we, we have uh, a stella that was uh, erected by Merneptah where he uh, describes his, his campaigns in the region and he includes uh, the defeat of a people called Israel. And it's funny because he says his seed is destroyed forever, so he claims to have ended Israel and killed everybody. I know you're saying yourselves, then who's that guy up there lecturing in front of us who's descended from them? Well, may, maybe I'm lying, you know, you don't know. But, but Merneptah is the end of the 13th century BCE. So people usually use that as, as you know, an earliest possible date that we can confirm of uh, Israel being there because they're, they're referred to by somebody. Then there's uh, people who said that uh, by the time you get to uh, David and Solomon, you're still, you're talking about 1000 BCE down to the, uh, the 900s, like Solomon ends around 922 BCE. Uh, and uh, the argument is made that there, there are no texts, no inscriptions ever with the name of David or Solomon on them. So how can you say that, that this was some major kind of kingdom if nobody ever talked about them and, and then they themselves aren't mentioned in anything. And then um, at the city of Don, which is the northernmost city in Israel, uh, the uh, archaeologist uh, from Hebrew Union College in Israel, uh, Avraham Diran, who, who died not too long ago at the age of 100, I think he was. But, but he, was, he was about 85, somewhere in his 80s, when um, the story is it's the last day of the dig and the jeeps are all loaded and they're all leaving. He'd been digging at Don since, I think, since the time of ancient Don. I mean, he was really <laughs> old and, and uh, he'd been digging this one site forever. And um, he, uh, as they're leaving, uh, somebody kicks over this stone that was, I mean, it wasn't even deep down. And, and it turns over and it, it's got some writing on it. You know? And uh, 
it was, so, it was a broken stone, so somebody had used it for building something else. You do that with stones, you know, they're already cut and shaped, so it's good to build a wall or whatever out of it. And uh, it had some writing, so they cleaned it off, and it was in uh, Aramaic, in uh, the, the, the script of the 9th, 8th century. And uh, this is, is apparently by uh, an, an Aramean. Remember, Aram is, is over here. It's what is today Syria. And uh, he claims to have uh, defeated uh, Israel in battle. And he refers to the two kings whom he defeated, um, the, uh, the king of Israel, the Melech Yisrael, and the king of Right, so Israel's the northern king, the southern king is Judah, where remember the kings are all descendants of David. So he says he, he got the Melech Yisrael, the king of Israel, and the Melech, and then it says this, the Melech Beit Dawid, the house of David. So, wow! So you get the name David and a reference to the two kingdoms, like in the Bible. This was, this was really good. So, um, the doubters said, oh, you think that says the king of the house of David. That doesn't say the house of David. It's, he's the king of Beit Daud, which is the name of a town. See, because there are towns that have Beit in them, like Bethlehem is Beit Lechem, which I mean, I think it's the house of food or the house of bread. And, and uh, so he's, they named other examples uh, of that Beit Shan. I mean, there are places that are Beit something. I said, so this isn't Beit David, the, the, the king of the house of David. It's the king of Beit Daud. And everybody said, but we've never heard of any such place. This, what, what, what is Beit Daud? And, and they said, it's a hitherto unknown town that he was the king of, of which he was the king. And um, so the following summer, they're excavating again, and they find another broken piece of this Beit David inscription. And it gives the name of the king of Israel and the name of the king of the house of David, and they're two parallel kings from the right period in the Bible. So what did the doubters say to that? They say, oh, well, that's very convenient. As soon as we showed you that it was a Beit Daud and it wasn't Beit David, you guys find more with just what you need. It's clearly a forgery. And so they've argued that the whole thing uh, is a forgery. Um, what can I tell you? I, I've held that thing in my hand. Um, my daughter was four and a half. She held that in her hands. We got, we got to, to um, uh, Professor Viran's office at Hebrew Union College uh, before they moved it and put it in the museum, so I just pulled it out of the closet and looked at it, and there it was. And I suppose I could be fooled. I, uh, it, it's the right kind of script with the right kind of stuff, and it's... And then on top of that, there's, uh, you remember the Mesha uh, stele? I had referred to this uh, earlier, that there was King Mesha, who was the king of Moab. And he's mentioned in the Bible, he's defeated by Omri and then Ahab, and then later, uh, uh, you know, can, can, he's, uh, uh, Moab was uh, subjugated to uh, Israel from the time of uh, uh, David or Solomon, and that in the time of Omri and Ahab, he rebelled, and he erected a stella that's about the size of this, this lectern, about this height, and kind of curved, and you can look up pictures, just. Google the word Mesha images, and you'll immediately see uh, pictures of this inscription. And uh, so that was from Moab, so it's from over here. And, uh, and it's in 9th century Moabite, which is what it should be. And it's one of only two inscriptions we have in Moabite. So uh, really, if you, we should just give a, a mini course, you know, where everybody could come in for a weekend, and you could learn the whole corpus of Moabite. And for the rest of your life, on, on your CVs, you know, it's languages, Spanish, Moabite, English, you know, and, and, and everybody will be so impressed with that. You'll get jobs, you'll get admitted to grad schools. I mean, everything you want, I'm giving you the secret here. Just put Moabite down. You know, it'll only take you a little while to learn the two inscriptions in Moabite. And uh, Moabite is, is nearly identical to Hebrew. I mean, it, it was right across the river and uh, a related language. 
And, um, and people have always made a big deal of that because he refers to King Omri by name. And, and, uh, and he also says, I've destroyed Israel, his seed is no more. So that was always a famous thing, that the, the, the two earliest references to Israel in uh, archaeologically discovered inscriptions both said Israel's destroyed, it's gone, you know, and you go, ha ha, you know, and still, still here, still here, you know. And um, it's like if you lose a game 40-something to seven, and they say, well, you're destroyed, you are no more, and then the next week you score 63. I mean, it could happen. So I'm trying to be relevant with football. I'm at the University of Georgia. You got to do this stuff, you know. Next semester, I'll do gymnastics will be my metaphor in all the classes. So uh, it was only recently, though, that, that a, a great uh, a French scholar of uh, inscriptions, uh, André Lemaire, uh, Professor Lemaire, read a part near the bottom of the, the Mesha inscription that's very hard to read. And the reason it's so hard to read is uh, the people who discovered it, um, I think they were Bedouin, they, they, um, they didn't like it. They didn't know what it was, they couldn't read it, and so they decided they would do what any intelligent person would do, to, they tried to destroy it. So they put it on the fire and got it super hot and then threw ice on it so that it would crack, which it did. So a very, if you look at the pictures of it, you'll see half of it is written pretty clearly, and the other half is written in this foggy kind of way, which is mostly reconstructed. And uh, in one of the very difficult to read lines, Andre Lemaire read the words, Beit David. So if there's this House of Dowd place, Apparently now there's two references to it. So he also, so that's a, a second reference to the King of the House of David. So the old argument that there's no reference to David or Solomon is, is just over. We've got at least two there. Uh, pharaoh Sheshonk I, he was the pharaoh from 931 to 910 BCE. I say that with a certain caution that any of you have ever studied ancient Egypt, you know that there are different datings and chronology of of, of uh, Egypt's history and, and careers are made and destroyed over this and, and people hate each other over this. And you, you want to say, like, give it a break, you know? It's just, I, I almost want to say the same as with football. It's only a game, you know? And, and uh, but we understand him to be in the, in the, the, uh, the latter 10th century, this uh, Pharaoh Sheshank I. And um, the Bible specifically refers to uh, a pharaoh named Shishak at the time who came into to Judah uh, and, 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 and raided Jerusalem. And uh, this Sheshank says he did that. He, he describes his, his campaigns uh, into uh, uh, the region there. And um, I remember one of the uh, scholars who doubts this uh, who, who questions about the existence of ancient Israel and the whole period of the kings um, was uh, in a session together with me and, and a couple of other scholars. And when they took questions from the audience, uh, uh, Professor uh, Max Miller, who was a very uh, fine biblical historian at uh, Emory University, and uh, he was in the, the, the audience and he raised his hand and he said, if the Bible's just making this up, how did they get Pharaoh Sheshonk, he said, in the right time and pew. I mean, how did they, if you're, how, how would somebody who's supposed to be making this up hundred years later, hundreds of years later, how would he know that there was a Pharaoh by that name who was in Israel at that time? And so he said, how do you get him in the right time and pew? And um, uh, the, the, the speaker said, he, he was a very tall man and big arms, and he went, I wish I knew. Well, I'm going like, I wish I knew isn't a good enough answer. Um, the, the, this was, uh, we only know about Shishak, Sheshank, because we now have archaeology and ancient texts and we, we know. But how would some guy, you know, just a few hundred years after Sheshank in ancient Israel know to make the guy up at the right, and get him at the right time? Um, Likewise with the Mesha stone, it, it's referring to King Omri and it begins with the words Anuki Mesha, I am Mesha, king of Moab, and it's got them at the right time 
uh, also. So it's not just that you find something that's in the right language and refers to the right people, but they have to get their facts right too or else you, you doubt them as uh, evidence. Or there's something known as the Kurch Monument, K-U-R-K-H. Uh, this was erected by Shalmaneser III. Uh, I know a lot of you preferred Shalmaneser II, but, but Shalmaneser III, one of the uh, Assyrian uh, emperors, and he refers to going up against Ahab, and he ascribes to Ahab 2,000 chariots in a battle. Now, you know these guys exaggerate. So if you defeated a guy, you'd love to say, yeah, I defeated him and he had 2,000 chariots, so maybe it was only 12, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's unlikely that it's that much of a, an exaggeration. <laughs> the point is he's recognizing that he was going up against an opponent who was well equipped, and, and also maybe it was 2,000 chariots. So uh, that's, and he's got the name Ahab, and he's got Ahab in the right time in Pew. Also of Shalmaneser, there's something known as the Black Obelisk. Uh, the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser, and this is standing in the, the British Museum. It's not even like behind a glass case or a fa I mean, you can just walk right up and touch the darn thing in, in uh, the British Museum, which is one of the extraordinary places in the world. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the British Museum in London, you, you, you go to the British Museum. I, I was walking up the staircase and I turned and I bump into the Rosetta Stone. You know, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> the British Museum is special, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and you can just bump into the, the Black Obelisk of uh, Shalmaneser. And um, the, it's dated around 840 uh, BCE. And uh, at that time, you should have uh, Jehu is the, uh, the king of Israel. Uh, you remember, he was the one who, sort of, who ended the dynasty of Ahab. He went in and, 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 and uh, attacked there and all. And uh, there's a mention of the king of Israel by the name of Jehu. It's got a drawing of him, so it's one of the few pictures we have of, of maybe what Israelites looked like. We only have a few that, that actually give us an idea of what people looked like in the biblical period. The most important fact being they don't wear kafiyas, you know, the, the Bedouin headdress. Every movie does that. Um, I don't know what to tell you. They, they did not wear uh, kafias. That was that uh, European travelers to the Middle East in the medieval times or later met Bedouin who dressed like that. So they assumed, oh yeah, that's how Bible people dressed. And you go, why? No reason. Just, they wore that. They could have worn top hats. It's just as likely <laughs> as that they, they, they wore uh, cloth they, or, or any kind of hat. In fact, in this picture, if you look at Jehu, he's wearing a hat. So um, what's interesting is the Assyrian text does get one of the facts wrong. It refers to him as Jehu, son of Omri. He's not a son of Omri. He's like the guy who ended the Omri uh, dynasty. So it could be that the Assyrian emperor just didn't know that. He just assumed, you know, the last Israelite king he'd heard of was named Omri, so this one he calls son of Omri. Or, you know, son of also means a member of a group uh, in Hebrew. The word son of or daughter of is used in a great variety of ways in Hebrew. So if you're 18 years old, like to this day in, in, in Israel, you would say, I am a son or a daughter of 18. That's how you, you say I'm 18 years old. And, and uh, if uh, the, the children of Israel, right, are called in English, we call them children of B'nai, the, the, the Israel, the children of Israel, which means a member of Israel. So some English translations now even, wherever it says B'nai Yisrael in the Hebrew, instead of using the, old, the traditional old children of Israel, they'll translate it as Israelite, which is what those are. Or you saw uh, the B'nai Elohim, the sons of the gods, means, means the gods. So when he calls him Ben Omri, <coughs> he could just mean a member of the Israelite dynasty and he doesn't happen to know that that he's not a direct descendant. But you saw it for, for uh, all the kings of Judah, they don't say Melech Yehuda, king of Judah, they say Melech Beit David, the, the king of the house of David. So they understood uh, countries in terms of dynasties. Uh, in a way, I sound a little too apologetic when I say that. I mean, you can also just say, it's wrong, there's something wrong on that Stella, but I mean, that doesn't make the Stella fake. We know it's not a fake. I mean, we really got the thing. It was, it was found, you know, in what is now Iraq. Uh, but it, uh, uh, it's an authentic thing in which a king authentically made a mistake and got something wrong. 
Um, there's um, uh, Adad Narari uh, III, who uh, again from, from uh, the Assyrian region in the late 9th, early 8th century BCE, and he refers to Israel as the land of Omri. So it may be they thought Israel's the land of Omri, Judah's the land of David. Tiglath Pileser III, who's one of my favorites because his, I like his name, uh, he refers to a king of Judah named Yahuhazi, That's that would be an Akkadian Jehoahaz, who again, it's, it's one of the kings uh, we know from uh, the Bible, and especially Sennacherib. You read about when you read it in Who Wrote the Bible, uh, and when we talked about it in class, that Sennacherib was the one who surrounded Jerusalem when Hezekiah was the king, and he refers to Iazak. Iazakiyahu Iudiah, Hezekiah the Jew, as the, the, uh, the, the king of the, uh, the Judeans. He says that he conquered 46 towns. Um, I don't think he's exaggerating because uh, the Bible too reports that he basically conquered everything except Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, he made such a big deal of his conquering Lachish. He was so proud of the destruction of Lachish that um, <clears throat> It's all pictured on the walls of his palace, which have now all been torn off the palace, and you can find them in the walls of the British Museum. And, uh, and some, now, sometimes I can be very critical and say, well, look, the Brits stole everything, you know, that the, the, the Turks and <laughs> the others hadn't taken already. Uh, so all the good stuff is, is in the museum in, in Istanbul or the, the British Museum in London, um, plus, uh, you know, the Mesha is in the, is in the Louvre in Paris. Um, but this idea of, of theft for museums, on the one hand, is terrible, and I'm critical of it, um, that, that the, uh, the Elgin marbles, these, these fabulous uh, uh, statues that were on the Acropolis in Greece, uh, they were taken, and they're in the British Museum, too, and, 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 and Greece has been trying to force England to give them back forever. Um, on the other hand, uh, if the Elgin mar marbles had stayed in Athens, they would have been wrecked. Uh, like if you've heard of the Porch of the Maidens, there are these six statues of these women. They're, they're called the Caryatids, and, and, but they're like columns, and, and they hold up the roof of the thing. So it's beautifully carved columns as the bodies of these women. And some of them were taken by Lord Elgin and are among the Elgin marbles in, in uh, London, and others remained in Greece and, were repla and the missing ones replaced with copies. And uh, the ones that remained, the, the uh, air pollution in Athens, Greece, as opposed to here, where the air is clean and pure, the, uh, the, the air there, it, it, it's serious enough that it was damaging. The, the faces of the Caryatids weren't visible anymore, and they've been recarved. And uh, likewise, all the things that the British uh, stole uh, from uh, the, uh, especially uh, Nineveh, which had so much there, um, you can always say if they hadn't stolen it, then in the, the, the two wars in Iraq that were fought in your lifetimes, uh, a lot of that would have been destroyed, uh, looted, uh, damaged. Uh, so I, don't, I, I honestly don't know what's the right thing here, uh, whether it's better to, to preserve old stuff by putting in museums or, you know, that. An interesting thing came up in, in Professor Levy's meeting with the religion department. Uh, after all, he's meeting with professors in all different fields, and though he's, he's concentrated, especially in the Levant, he has dug and been involved in things all around the world. And uh, it came up with, with my colleague, Professor Spina, who teaches uh, Hinduism, and I thought, well, he's going to have nothing to say to her. And then so somebody asked about, uh, you know, there were those, those uh, tremendous Hindu uh, uh, carved uh, uh, gods, which were destroyed by the Taliban during the period that they were in power, and, uh, and, and they're gone. I mean, they, it took them several times, but they blew them up, and, and they're gone completely. It, it's just a horrible, horrible thing that happened. And they asked uh, Levy about that, and he said, well, you know, we do this um, uh, virtual reconstruction. So he had shown us videos of this sort of thing, but he said that was done. They had done that before these things were, were, were destroyed by the Taliban. So they're actually, I, I mean, electronically, you can look at them as if they're still there, you know, and you can just look it up and do it on a computer screen, but they're talking about doing it in a way, like, I don't know, with lasers or whatever, 
so that like, you know, the ghosts of those things would still be standing looking exactly, I mean, exactly the same on the spots where they once were. Now, I admit that's not as good as the original, but uh, it is amazing, this level we've reached uh, in archaeology. And, uh, you know, if you can't get the original marbles back in Greece, then you can make these <laughs> virtual, <laughs> virtual marbles back in Greece. So the Sennacherib inscription is tremendous because it's in parallel with the story in the Bible. And where the two have something in common, that, that's good. They both have the same number of talents of gold that were paid you know, in tribute by, by the Jews to the uh, Assyrians. And, uh, and, and they got the names right, and they got the dates right, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, likewise, the, uh, the Siloam inscription uh, Siloam is a, uh, the, the tunnel I've mentioned uh, that goes under Jerusalem. I told you you can go through it and you're in water up to about here and, and tight walls and not for claustrophobic people. And uh, where they, they brought the water in probably is what saved Jerusalem during the uh, Syrian uh, siege. But it was only in recent times that, that somebody looked up at the right moment and saw in the ceiling of this uh, tunnel an inscription and it's in, in uh, Hebrew, and it's in, in uh, Hebrew of, uh, trust me for the moment, we'll get there, to an 8th century Hebrew script uh, describing the, the building of that tunnel. And uh, the next is uh, uh, the seals and bullae that mention uh, King Jeroboam II, King Uzziah, King Ahaz, King Hezekiah, King Hoshea. Total, we have 15 of the kings of Israel or Judah from the Bible mentioned in other archaeologically found inscriptions, and 15 out of 15 are in the right time for that king. Now what all this shows is not just that, okay, some, some people in the Bible really existed. Great. I mean, that's, that's nice in itself. And sure, if you find something with the name of somebody in the Bible on it, sure, that's cool. You want to be the one who found it and, you know, tell your friends for the whole rest of your life about that. But, uh, but what you're looking at is the evidence of an existing community, right? A, a whole culture with a government, with borders, with political relations and military relations with the other country. Everything that you'd call a country today. We haven't yet found their flag, you know. I'm pretty sure it didn't have a six-pointed star on it because that that's a very late, 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 late uh, Jewish symbol. If they, if they, I mean, according to the Bible, the, the symbol of, of, of the, the, the religion is the seven-branch candelabra, not, not the, the six-pointed star. Six-pointed stars are easier to make, though, to draw. So when, you're, when you're picking a symbol for your club, your organization, your religion, your country, you want to make something like, that's really easy. Uh, to do, yeah, which Christianity wins. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, anybody who's got two sticks, you know, you, I, I mean, I'm, being, I'm making light of something that's very serious. I understand, but 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 it, it was a brilliant, a brilliant choice of symbol. And, and many of you know that the cross was not the original symbol of Christianity. The original of, of Christianity was the fish, and that's why some you know Christians have returned to using the fish. You'll see people have the, the fish symbol on the back of their car or whatever. And um, the, for the first few centuries of Christian art, you never see the cross because the early Christians understood what a cross was. It, it, I mean, it was a horrible, horrible uh, death. It was a terrible symbol uh, to them. And, and uh, even, I mean, uh, Americans or very world, people around the world recently got some sense of it when, when Mel Gibson, not my favorite guy, uh, made, uh, though, his movie, uh, about, uh, from the uh, Gospel of John, uh, in which you see the horror of the way that, that the Romans uh, executed. I personally have not watched the movie. I watched like a minute of it and couldn't take any more. Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty horrible. And, and the, the early Christians understood that, and they would not make the cross the symbol of their religion. And it was only later when people weren't doing that anymore, crucifixion, that you could have the cross uh, become the symbol. And, and uh, it's like in, uh, when I was pretty young still, the, 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 uh, the comedian uh, Lenny Bruce was one of the first great American political satire comedians. Uh, Lenny Bruce did a routine 
where he said, um, it's a good thing that they didn't uh, kill Jesus in the 20th century because he said then all the Catholic kids would be going around with little electric chairs around their neck. This was in the period when America was still doing electric chairs. We've stopped that one. We're so much more moral now. We just get it. And, and uh, I'm sorry. Who invented the electric chair? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was anti-capital punishment, and he invented the electric chair because it was believed then that that was a speedier, less painful death than hanging and, you know, the guillotine and other things that have been used for killing people. The guillotine, I'm told, I don't know, it was the same thing, the history of execution. They thought it would kill you fast. And they weren't, whereas there are some kinds of executions where they deliberately make it long and painful. And, uh, uh, well, how do I get on these things? Um, where was I? Symbol of biblical times. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. So, what, what Lenny Bruce was doing as a joke, remember Lenny Bruce? The, what he was doing as a joke, that he was saying, well, the Catholic kids would be wearing uh, an electric chair around their neck. The early Christians understood that the cross was an electric chair of their time, and they wanted no part of it. And then, you get, see, so you get little sidelights on history, even AD, that I always claim I don't know, uh, even though I, I did live my whole life. A.D., you know, <laughs> there are those who question that. <laughs> so let's turn to a different area. All of that was then the inscriptional evidence, which you can see is, is especially attractive because if somebody wrote something, that's, that's more specific. And whenever I make jokes about, well, Aaron said to Moses, Mom, always liked you better, or uh, we find inscription, Moses, Tzipporah, I love you, and stuff like that. Uh, that even makes a better joke because a, a written thing is just specific. But even non-specific stuff is valuable. So today, more and more, as uh, anthropology has become more and more the queen science in biblical studies. Right? For a while, uh, it was originally historical study. Well, it was originally theological study was the main kind of study of the Bible. Then for a long time, we were in the historical uh, period of it. And then since, oh, the 1970s or so, literary study of the Bible became really big. And then in the last 10, 20 years especially, uh, anthropological study has become tremendously important. And uh, anthropologists have a sense of material culture, which means stuff, things you find that are really the remnants of a culture. And if somebody wanted to reconstruct what American society was like, and they, so they could, you know, a thousand years from now, dig up the ruins of ancient Athens, Georgia, and they, they go through, you know, they find dormitory rooms, and they find, you know, the things that are on the walls, and the, they would do, you have a television set, do you have a computer, do you, uh, the things you would find, the culture, reveal a tremendous amount, arguably more than just finding an inscription, one of you wrote a note, you know, to your girlfriend or something like that. So, uh, in material culture, I quoted a uh, thing from Professor uh, uh, John Holliday, who said, what we have now is the archaeologically discernible characteristics of a state. That is, you're not only finding this item or that item, but you're finding stuff that implies that there was a governed country there. And that is clearly Israelite from, at the latest, the, the, uh, the Iron II period, um, even Iron I, the number, I, Anthropologists and archaeologists, they like this, they go by what metal was, was the best at the time. So you have to know the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. I, I like numbers, you know. So Iron One is 1200 to 900 BCE, roughly. Iron Two, 900 to 600. So Iron Two is really the period of the kings of uh, Israel and Judah. And, uh, and that the, cult, the material culture is clearly Israelite from, from then on at least Iron II, if not Iron I. Uh, the the, the uh, inscriptions like in Jerusalem you know, that, that are in Hebrew and all, and the architecture. Uh, the famous case was uh, the gates of the, the three cities of uh, Megiddo, Hatzor, and Gezer. Um, They, when Yigal Yadin, the great Israeli archaeologist, was excavating uh, at Megiddo, they found uh, this particular kind of gate. It's, it's, it's like a, a triple gate. Here's one side of it. That is not the letter E. That's one side of the gate. And the other side, right, looked like this. 
they did them better than I do. And uh, so if you were trying to conquer the city and you break through the, the gate, all you find is like you're, you're looking into a second gate with guys shooting at you, you know, rocks and arrows and spears. And all. So you break through that one, and all you're looking at is guys shooting at you with rocks and arrows and spears. And so it was a, 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 uh, an effective defense. And then there, there was a certain building, uh, uh, thought to be some sort of uh, uh, temple or sacred building, and very, very other things nearby, government building. And he looked at, at the structure of it, and it, it looked remarkably like the gate at the city of Chatzor. So now you've got Megiddo and you've got Chatzor, and, and they, they both have this, this gate. And uh, he looked up in his Bible, where, you know, in the Book of Kings, it says that, that uh, First Kings, that, that Solomon uh, built up the cities of Megiddo, Chatzor, and Gezer. So he predicted that if we would excavate at Gezer, we're going to get a gate that looks just like that. And they did, and they did. And it was one of those great things where in archaeology, you, you, you predict you're going to find X, and then you find uh, X. And um, so this was taken as pretty serious evidence that the biblical report of King Solomon was, uh, was correct. And, and even though to this day, we have still not found any inscription with the name Solomon on it, right? We've got David. We do not have Solomon. Uh, that, was, that was pretty serious evidence that uh, you know, something that was really there, and not just anything, but, but a, uh, a government. And that the fact that they're all built according to the same architectural plan is significant because that's evidence of a central government. And so if you go and look at uh, some post office in Athens, Georgia, and then you're traveling and, and you're in Montana or someplace, and, the, and there's a post office that looks just like the one here, that didn't just happen by chance. It's that there's a central government, you know, with a postmaster general in Washington, and there's no reason why if they're going to build thousands of post offices in America that they're going to draw a different architectural plan for each one of them. So there's, there's a central one that's saying, okay, we'll use it here, and we'll use it there, and we'll use it there. And that is apparently uh, what, what is revealed about uh, Solomon. Uh, there, there have recently been uh, doubts by that. Uh, the uh, Israeli archaeologist uh, Israel Finkelstein uh, challenged all of it and claimed that, because he claims there was no Davidic or Solomonic uh, kingdom, that it couldn't have been. Uh, society, culturally, they weren't developed enough to have done that by that time. So he uh, said that it must have been uh, that those cities were built up by uh, King Omri or Ahab, uh, you know, which a hundred years later. And on the one hand, I don't care that much who's right, because either way, you've got a central government, a king building pretty major cities in, in ancient Israel. But in fact, I, I think he's right that it's, um, it was, that he's wrong, that, that Yadin was right, that, that uh, it really is Solomonic. Um, the co-director of the excavations of Megiddo, where, where uh, Finkelstein was, is uh, Professor Halpern, who's my colleague here at, at the University of Georgia. And, and Halpern sat me down on top of that gate at Megiddo and made his case, which I found persuasive, that, uh, that it really, it, it's, it's lower down than the time of uh, King Omri. Uh, what what uh, Finkelstein apparently did not see, I think, was that there's a little ridge in, in the uh, side of, uh, of this here. And, and now we don't have this side of it, it's completely gone, right? The, the other side is reconstructed, and obviously it had to be there because that's how you build these gates. You have to, the other side too, what's the point, you know? And it's like finding a door and no door jams, but you figure chances are there were door jams you know, where the door kept falling down, you know? So um, uh, he showed this little ridge, so presumably this would have the little ridge too. Now why would they have that? And he said, because you had to take a giant like a piece of wood that's extended across them, and, and you're, you're walking above all of that. That's Omri's period, that's, and, and the deeper down is when these things were built, and that would be Solomon's uh, period. And, um, but I, I don't need to have the big fight over Yadin, Halpern, um, uh, Finkelstein, which one is right. The point is that you're looking at evidence of a state with a central government. I'd like it to be Solomon. I think it's Solomon. I don't know. My uh, students and I excavated, I mentioned, in the city of David under the great uh, archaeologist uh, Yigal Shiloh. Who, he was my friend. He died too young. And uh, he uh, excavated for eight years there, though. And uh, if you look in the photographs, just uh, uh, if you Google City of David, 
Um, you will see among the images that come up a picture of what's called the stepstone structure. It's something, if we call this the, the bottom of it, when you're looking down at it, I would say we go about twice the height of this room, of these steps going up. But the steps are very narrow. It's, it's like here's a brick and the next brick is overlapping it there. So there's no way that it's wide enough that you could put a human foot on it. So these were not steps for walking up. Uh, it is thought that uh, one possibility is that they were like a retaining wall to hold the dirt back, and that would be necessary because now, since then, we've uh, uh, excavated, there, there, there was a building up at the top, a giant's called Monumental Architecture. That means a, a giant building up at the top, and so it may have been like that. That's also, some of you know, the, the famous, the Western Wall in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and they say, well, it's the wall of the temple. And you know, it's not the wall of the temple. The temple is way up above it where, where that mosque is now. It was a retaining wall. If you could look behind the western wall, you don't see the other side of the wall there. You see dirt. It's, it's, it, it, it's holding up the hillside. And it was done that because they, they had built a temple uh, up above. And, and this is, is like that, too. This is probably that. We don't know. Uh, it says that, that uh, David's time they built something called the Milo, and we think maybe this is the Milo. It was either a defensive structure or a retaining structure or a water holding structure. We don't know. But what I do know is this was not like, you know, a fraternity got together on a weekend and said, let's build a step thing, and it'll be a big joke on everybody because it, it's not wide enough, so anybody who tries to walk down, it will slide down. You know, I mean, this, this is not like something that a few kids built on a weekend for fun, either. This is, it takes a government to build a thing like this. It takes a large number of people, great deal of money, a lot of time. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's material culture evidence that there was something substantial uh, there. And then uh, at the top of it, uh, the uh, archaeologist Eilat Mazar, also, f I mean, I'm, I'm friends with all these people, she uh, uh, uncovered this giant building at the top, and it's, it's from the right period, so she, she claimed it was very possibly uh, the palace of King David. Well, you know, you get on the front page of the New York Times if you say you found the palace of King David. You don't get on the front page of the New York Times if you say, I found monumental architecture in Jerusalem. You know, so, um, so some people jumped all over for that she was overstating the evidence and all. And uh, so I'm, I'm giving you, you know, what we know. There's a big piece of monumental architecture in Jerusalem, some very big building for some important purpose at the top of this stepstone structure, uh, and it's from the right period. So if it's not David's palace, it's... It's his brother's palace. I mean, it's, it's the, where the general kept his, his stuff. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a tremendously big, important find. And again, it's evidence that we're not just talking about uh, a few people getting together on a weekend to build these things. This is evidence of a centralized government. Likewise, that Siloam Tunnel that I mentioned, where the water is under there, where you are, just so you know, they say it's the length of six football fields. Now, I, I like football. I know how long a football field is. That's 100 yards. That's 600 yards. That's a big tunnel. And that is also, that's not something like, you know, a bunch of us got together and said, Let, this will be cool. Let's build a tunnel. You know? This was done as, as a water channel that probably saved the life of Jerusalem uh, from conquest uh, in history. And if we walk through it, you'll see you're going to be walking a long time. So um, Halpern said, uh, in, in uh, writing about this, he said, under Hezekiah and Manasseh, Judah crossed over from a traditional economy based on extensive agriculture to a cash-cropping industrial economy, a transition that implied and produced a centrally directed state. Now, I don't expect you to memorize that sentence from Halpern. But the point is that he's talking at a fairly sophisticated level about a transition happening in society and government based on the um, material culture that showed that the developments that were happening in the society had to have been directed by a central government. It's not just like, you know, a, a, a club got together and did it. Um, the Temple at Arad, likewise. 
Um, you know, for, and who wrote the Bible? I made the argument that uh, the tabernacle of the Bible was either six or eight cubits wide by 20 cubits long, which fits in the space under the wings of the cherubs in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Uh, and at Arad, I said they, they excavated and found a temple there in the 20th century. And uh, that, now you're not supposed to have a temple anywhere outside of Jerusalem, but there it is. There were Jews who had a temple at Arad and that the, the sons of Korach functioned apparently as priests, uh, as Levites there. And uh, the measurements of that uh, temple that they found at Arad is 6 by 20. I love being proved right. You know, it's like, the, the only thing better is if you're in, in an argument, if I'm in an argument with my wife and I've proved right. That's, it's, it, it, it is good to be right. Good to be right. Yeah. The only thing with the uh, Arad Temple is it's a uh, broad room instead of long room. Yes, it's the wrong way. I admit it's that. Reversed. Yeah, what he's saying is uh, the tabernacle should be like this, and you enter here, and the the one at Arad is like this, and you enter here. I admit it. Right measurements. People don't know where to put a door. The, yeah. If they, I mean, <laughs> Um, Lachish also, uh, this the, was the second biggest city in Judah, uh, destroyed uh, you know, by Sennacherib, presumably. There's both the excavation of the site itself, which has revealed to us so much about uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the gates there, too, and the, the city and, and, and all that. Uh, but that also there's the drawings of Lachish and all on, on, uh, on the palace walls of Nineveh, which are now on the, the palace walls of the British Museum. There's all kinds of pottery that have the, the four Hebrew letters, Lamed Mem Lamed Kaf. You know, that's king is Melech. La Melech, meaning belonging to the king, according to the king. It's like when you buy something and it says this is six fluid ounces according to the, was it the FDA? And it, it, it's, it's uh, you find lamelech, meaning various containers have met some central national standard for what size that container is supposed to be. Again, that doesn't just happen. It suggests that there's a central government and that central government is one that functions in the Hebrew language. All right, so we've got all of that. We're going to turn to three more bodies of evidence that support this next time. So that if you ever say to somebody, yeah, I took a course about ancient Israel, and they say, oh, that didn't exist. That's just a bunch of fairy tales in the Bible. You can say, well, we'll talk later about whether the stories in the Bible are all true or false or made up or not. But the place and that world existed.